Hey there, Postcard Pros. Today we are interviewing Joe Leon, the CEO of Get Steward, which is a lead generation service that we've used for over a year. And we're going to talk to him about lead generation. So Joe, tell us a little bit about uh, about your company, how you founded it, where, where it came from, and, and a little bit about what you do. Yeah. So, well, first, Jordan, thanks for, uh, for having me. Much appreciated. Um, so we started Steward two years ago, uh, almost to the day. Um, built out of a need. I was at a tech startup running growth. We were uh, expanding to s a different cities. So it was kind of that city by city growth model. And every time we would get to a new city, there'd be this huge bottleneck with data. Uh, data always prevented us from moving fast as fast as we wanted to. So we tried outsourcing, uh, we tried doing it ourselves, we tried basically everything, Upwork, Olan, uh, Odesk, Elance, everything. Um, and nothing was really up to our standards. Uh, the data was usually like 60 to 70% accurate or it wasn't complete, something was wrong with it. And that was really frustrating. So um, the idea was if we could combine really high quality research with a little bit of tech to make sure that the data is accurate and we could actually have a really strong uh, service for our clients. So fast forward to, the, to today, I would say about 70% of our business is building super highly targeted lead lists for clients, primarily startups. We work with about 250 companies across the globe with primarily it's focused on the US. Um, and yeah, our bread and butter is making sure that sales teams know exactly who to reach out to for sales purposes and whether it's sending something by mail, sending an email, calling them on the phone, we can capture all that, all that information. So tell me exactly what a highly qualified leads list means. Like break that down for me. Yeah. So step one in any project is helping the customer determine what their ideal customer profile looks like. So that's stuff like what types of companies, so where are they located, what industries, what is their business model, um, do they use certain type of tech, uh, could be anything. There's a lot of different factors we can look at. And then we jump, jump down a level to contacts. What type of person should you be speaking with? And oftentimes, working with a lot of young businesses, they might not already know who they should be working with. So part of the discovery process is helping them identify a couple different buckets of individuals at companies that we can help them test and reach out to to figure out exactly which one, um, which market resonates best with their value proposition. So, um, you know, helping them determine exactly what types of contacts looks like, you know, what titles are relevant, what job responsibilities, how long have they been in seat, where have they worked before, stuff like that. So after we build this ideal customer profile, which is a pretty common term, and a lot of companies come to us with that already, um, we can go out and research the data. And the beauty of our team is we didn't invest a lot of time or resources into building tech on the data acquisition side. So instead, we have trained and tested a lot of uh, contractors all over the world that are experts in researching uh, this information online, sales research. And uh, they'll go out and gather this information using every publicly available data source that is relevant to the project. And then we built tech to help uh, scale the QA side of things. So after a lead list is, uh, is you know, researched, they send it to us and we run it through our software to make sure that the phone number is right, the address is deliverable, like, which is important for your audience here. Um, well, the email address and the, and the mailing address, and then a whole bunch of other things too. Um, so that was, that was the focus for us is software for making sure the data is highly accurate. Can you talk about, I mean, you had mentioned something like uh, what things these folks have on their website. So if they have a Google AdWords pixel or something, can you talk about what types of criteria you can target? Hey, Jordan, by? I think it, it cut out for me for a second. What, what did you say? Oh, uh, sorry. My question was uh, what types of sources uh, of data are available? So I'm thinking like, I know that, you know, we've chatted in the past about doing projects that are like, look at people that have a Facebook ad pixel and a Google AdWords pixel on their website who have raised over, you know, $500,000 and are series A. Like, can you just talk about what sorts of targeting options are available? Got it. So it, again, it, it was cutting out a little bit there, but I just want to make sure I'll repeat the question. You're asking what 
targeting options are available to for when we're conducting research? Yep, yep. Okay, yeah, so uh, your example was definitely right on with the targeting pictures on the website. Um, you know, for us, I think the easiest for us is kind of just the standard fields, right? So it's your industry, it's your how many employees are working there, it's uh, you know, where you located. Those are kind of the basic fields. But then we get a lot of requests from folks that want to only target uh, companies that are using specific technology. So that's pretty easy for us. Um, we can't get every technology. So there's a lot of tech that companies use that's completely behind the scenes, and there's no indication. Uh, at least publicly, that a company is using that type of technology. So in those cases, sometimes we'll employ um, phone-based surveys to call into companies and kind of conduct a quick survey to ask, hey, are you using this type of technology or for your, I don't know, ERP system, like are you guys using XYZ? Um, so we can get that information via phone, which is often more expensive and it's kind of like a convoluted way to get there. Um, but I would say the vast majority of requests are kind of those standard fields I mentioned before. And then um, things like, yeah, like what, what tech are you using on your website? So it's like Optimizely, uh, like what are you using double click or whatever. I mean, we can, if there's a JavaScript tag on the, the homepage, it's pretty easy to get that information. Now you talked about addresses being deliverable. How do you validate that an address is deliverable? And specifically, how do you know that that person is at that company's address? You know, like if um, a company has multiple addresses, like, like talk to me about that process. Yeah, so uh, great question. So the making sure the address is deliverable, that's not that tough. Um, you know, there's a lot of services out there that are really good at kind of using the USPS database and then also combining some of their own proprietary data you bring that in as an API, and you can make sure that the address is deliverable. So that's in our software that we use. Um, that's not the hard part. The hard part is figuring out does that person work there. So, uh, you know, this is always a challenge. Uh, we're not perfect by any means, but we definitely do our best. So the way we would approach the, the task of identifying whether someone is working at a specific location is during our research process, collecting phone numbers, addresses, and names like we normally do. And then we have a separate team that would actually call into each phone number and ask, hey, is so-and-so at this location? And if they're not, we'll ask Whoa. what location are they at? Um, it doesn't work all the time. Uh, some people, I mean, everybody knows if you're in sales or marketing that gatekeepers can sometimes keep the information a little close to their chest. That's fine, not a big deal. But I would say like 90% of the time, as long as we can get on the phone with someone, we can usually confirm uh, that information. Now, you talked about being able to find different sources of data that are publicly available. Uh, are there some examples of that that you could provide as to where where you will go hunt for lead data? Yeah, I mean, it, it literally could be anywhere. I mean, I, I think the, the best, I try to explain this to my clients. So the, the best thing to think about is think through your process of finding whatever the best leads you can find are. So maybe... I don't know, maybe you need to go to indeed.com and look at who's hiring for a certain role and then those companies are the best for you. Um, the difference between you doing it and us doing it, we do have some you know, tips and tricks that we will employ to, to find information and access information that maybe you can't. But in general, we're just doing what you can do at scale, a lot faster and a lot cheaper. Because, I mean, if, if you're running a business or you're on a sales team, marketing team, whatever, your time's really valuable. Um, and we can step in for a fraction of what you should, you know, what you get paid to do and just get a <laughs> whole long list of exactly what, what you're looking for. So that, that can in, Indeed is a good example. I mean, but there's a ton. I mean, literally, literally anywhere that, that you would go to look for your target prospects, we've probably gone for another, another client. <laughs> That's great. Uh, now you talked about having, like you specifically have not scaled the technology side of finding leads mm -hmm. and you focused in on the QA piece. Can you just run me through what QA looks like? I mean, I think for folks that are trying to source their own lead, leads list, um, this is just helpful information to know about the types of things you do to verify that uh, a lead is, is, is good and they're not sending to a bad email address or a, or a bad physical address in our case. 
Yeah, so I, uh, I have the most experience with this. So we did this manually for a year and a half, uh, which was just the most wow. brutal, <laughs> yes. <laughs> excuse me, brutal process, um, which is why we invested in building tech to solve that. But so it's, uh, it's a lot of stuff. Um, so let's start with, you mentioned email addresses. So first and foremost, there's a lot of companies out there that are really good at figuring out if an email is valid or not. We use two different APIs in our software to check that. So that's not something that we built internally and said we rely on other companies because that space is very crowded and there are a bunch of sure. companies that do it very well already. So we rely on a couple companies for that. Um, checking mailing addresses is very similar, like I mentioned before. There's definitely several other companies that do this already. Um, again, we don't need to recreate the wheel, right? We can leverage other people's technology. So we did that for the mailing addresses. Um, something that's interesting, though, is other fields. So fields where us having a large data set, a large database, can help inform how we clean data. So those fields are things like uh, titles, uh, names, company names. So things of that nature need to be looked at very carefully. And oftentimes, a lot of folks, especially if you try to um, hire some, I guess, freelancers to get this information for you, Sometimes they don't pay that much attention to that, that those types of fields. So I'll give you a couple examples. So titles. Um, oftentimes, titles will just be scraped from whatever website they're found. They're not cleaned up. They could be in all caps. There could be weird characters. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a mess. And, and instead, our software standardizes and cleans everything up so that a when vice president is just VP. It's not vice space p it's not vp lowercase it's not v <laughs> dot p dot like it's it's all the same um yeah names names are good too i mean there's a lot of like junk characters and name fields a lot of times and as a, and a marketer especially an email marketer knows the last thing you want is to have the wrong name tag be pulled into a mail merge um so we spend a Ooh, lot of time that's making, bad. yeah no it's it's that's the worst because whenever i get that <laughs> i just the worst I just, my eyes glaze over. Hey, 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 Joel. <laughs> and that happens a lot. And that's, that's kind of yeah. frustrating. Um, and so the coolest thing, though, that I think about our tech and related to names is if we look in the email address and we see that you go by a nickname. So if I go by Joe in my email address and you oh, stick in Joseph wow. into the software, we know, and we we built an entire dictionary of, of nicknames and, and if they're weighted wow. based on formality, we'll switch the name that you put in to the appropriate nickname if we can figure determine that. So uh, wow. there's a lot to it. There, there's a lot involved. <laughs> can you just talk about how, like what's the breakdown of folks that are doing email campaigns versus print campaigns versus use phone numbers? Like what channels are you seeing people, people use? Uh, so I think we would see 90 Eight, 95 to 98 percent email um, the remaining wow. is print and phone and that should tell you something um, yeah that should tell you that you should probably be pursuing phone and, and print mail a bit more um, <laughs> I think I think doing I mean you guys have a great service um, and we definitely recommend people use you if they want to do a like a postcard like a mailing campaign but I think a lot of people are reluctant to do it just because it, it feels like a well, well, it's definitely more expensive than email, so that's the biggest thing. But probably yeah, second yeah, to that yeah. is it feels like it's probably like a logistical hurdle, even though somebody else could completely handle it for them, that in their minds it's hard for them to, like, get over that. I mean, and, and we're dealing with small, small businesses, startups, so it's a different market than, than you guys might be dealing with in part. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the fact that we primarily are serving people that are emailing shows you that you might want to consider other channels in, in your own outreach. Now, you run a lead generation company. Tell me about your marketing tactics. Tell me about how you guys do uh, marketing for Steward and what that looks like. And yeah, run me, run me through that process. Yeah, so this is a good example of not practicing what you preach. Um, <laughs> I think in the last two years, spent or well no, i guess not spent but we we only probably researched about 500 contacts 
for us to reach out to, maybe less. Uh, and we did we wow. did we did outbound email campaigns, which is another service we offer our offer to our customers, cold email drip campaigns. Yeah. Um, so we we built one of those, and that's been successful. Um, but primarily for selling cold email drip campaign services, not for building lead lists. I think, um, okay, especially. Probably several years ago, this was more so true than now, but people were just getting knocked over the head with um, emails, especially from folks overseas offering lead lists. And like, oh, I'm going to sell you like this list of like 10,000 leads. Then, you know, yeah. somebody bought it one time. It was terrible, obviously. And then uh, <laughs> no one else in the organization wants to make that mistake again. So they're reluctant to, to respond. So for us, outbound has been a difficult channel on the on like building lead lists on that service side um but we primarily rely on word of mouth and we were on product hunt in october of 2015 which uh still to this day uh well i think it builds a lot of credibility but a lot of people find us through product hunt still plus word of mouth wow. we i mean we have a pretty the business is steady and growing from just that but there's definitely more uh more we, we should be doing you know, I've found one thing interesting about interacting uh, with you is that, A, you're super fast on email. I can just chat with you via email, even though you're probably running, you know, hundreds of campaigns. I feel like if you look at a lot of startups that are running today, they're all about building software and, and, and that software takes the place of interacting with a person. Can you just talk to me about running your business in sort of a more personal way or is that just something that you do for me <laughs> no i mean that's well oh only for you jordan no. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> perfect that's what i want to hear <laughs> it's, um, that's i mean that's a good question so i I'm, I'm so tired of hearing the phrase like do things that don't scale and all this like i, I don't know i i, I think it, i personally believe that customer service is very very important um I think that treating people like I would want to be treated is also important. Um, and by the nature of what we do, we don't have a hugely complex, large organization. So we can take the time yeah. to get to know our customers. Um, and if anything, taking the time to get to know our customers, responding quickly, that actually is our marketing. You know, going back to what, what I was just saying is that the majority of our, our business comes from referrals and word of mouth. That's how we get it mm -hmm. is because we we develop these relationships with our clients. Um, so I mean, like the the day to day of, of how our operations work, um, it's it's all project based, and because it's project based, each project has an account manager. That's usually myself or my business partner, or maybe one of our other employees that oversees the project. So they're in constant communication with the client. Also, our teams that are researching the data, um, and because it's uh, there's a lot of communication back and forth, primarily via email, sometimes over the phone. Um, that's how we're able to really build relationships with with our customers. So I, I think, I think like in general, I'm that's I believe in being really high touch with clients, but also the nature of our business allows that too. There's definitely cases in different types of businesses where that's impossible, um, but but it's that it works for us. It's a it is a huge differentiator. Let me tell you that. I mean, I have I have called you at all sorts of crazy hours, and you yes. always pick yeah. up. So, so I, I think it, it makes a big difference. I, I think one thing I'm curious about is just to get your knowledge that if people are wherever they're sourcing their lists from, uh, what should they know? I mean, I feel like you've learned, uh, you know, even just some of the stuff you shared in the, uh, you know, on this interview about. Uh, nicknames and verifying addresses like if you're buying a leads list like what are the things that you should check what are the things that like how do you validate that the source that you're getting your data from is uh, especially if it's not directly from the source you know you're not getting it um, directly from you know your own LinkedIn connections or something how do you validate that that's good data and what should you check for well so if if you're running an email campaign primarily um, Sure. Running the email addresses through software to check if they're valid or not um, is a good first step. Um, ideally, you could research each contact and make sure that their title's right, they still work for that company, that type of stuff. And you could do that with a mixture of kind of looking them up online and calling the company. 
Um, ideally, the company you purchased the list from would have already done that for you. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's kind of tough. Like there's, it, it depends on the scenario. So if you're dealing with a, a freelancer, an individual that's going to be researching information for you, the best thing you can do is before you get started, give them a paid trial and say, I want you to find, <clears throat> excuse me, whatever the most valuable piece of information is for you. Maybe it's email, mailing address, whatever. Find this information for me for these 20 people and then do it yourself mm. as well. There's a little bit of time investment there, but it will be worth it. Uh, and make sure they did it correctly. Yeah. Um, that's, that's how we vet all of our new employees and contractors is making sure that they can achieve the standards that we want on a, like a test list. Um, so we highly recommend doing that uh, with any, honestly, any new company you could even do that with. Um, doesn't have to be a freelancer, yeah. um, but the expectation should be that it's going to be paid, that you'll pay them for their time because it's not something that they can sure. just go uh, and do in a second. Um, yeah. The other, so then there's companies like ours that kind of like a white glove service that are kind of like the go between between you having to deal with freelancers directly and then, you know, uh, we'll clean up the data for you, make sure it's it's all correct. Uh, and then there's also uh, database companies. So there's, I mean, these companies are very large. Um, they their business model is very difficult because they, uh, you know, B two B data goes bad. At, I, don't know, I heard some statistic five percent every month or something. I don't know something crazy. Wow. So they're they're constant. Wow. They're yeah, it's tough. So they have a very tough uh, business in that they have to continually upgrade and revalidate their data. And there's gonna definitely be times when the data's not right. Um, now on the other hand, they have a good business model because they can resell data to everybody and just give you access. It's more software based, um, sure. which is infinitely more scalable than my company, but. That said, there are drawbacks. So even with a company like it, like a like a database company, I would still say, you know, hey, here's a list of 50 contacts where they work. Find me their email addresses, and you already have them, and make sure that it lines up, and make sure that their data is good. Um, that's the best, probably the best advice I could give. Now you've been running this business uh, for a while, and you know you've got a ton of clients. So tell me, what are the three things, the non-intuitive things that you have learned while doing leads list? Like, what are things that coming into it you would have never expected that you're like, whoa, that's a thing, and I didn't expect that to be a thing? Um, that's a really tough one. I, I feel like if you if we spoke about a year and a half ago, it would be a bit more top of mind because that was when we, <laughs> we worked out a lot of the kinks. <clears throat> I think the biggest you thing is solve it, yeah. realizing that um, – <clears throat> It's so tempting when you're reviewing data and cleaning it to just be like, yeah, I think this is good, and then send it to the client. Um, but we don't do that. <laughs> like, like it's yeah. like, I don't know. I, I think back to like <clears throat> in school, at least like way back when I was in college and well, not that long ago, but when I was in college, there would definitely be times where I'd be like, well, I just want to be done with this paper, done with this project or whatever. And you just hand it in. You're like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, whatever. Maybe my grade changes a little bit. <clears throat> that attitude doesn't suffice in data. Like you have to be so yeah. patient and willing to just like just sit there and go row by row and really make sure it's right, um, and then deliver to the client only when you think and know. Well, not when you think, when you know it's accurate. Um, so I think patience was the biggest thing that I didn't really expect in this business. Mm. Um, the other, let's see, what else? Um, I the other thing is it's. And this is true in, in a lot of cases, but I, I guess I didn't realize how many folks I would interact with that would say, wow, you're you're too expensive. I can do this myself. And that just wouldn't understand <laughs> that their time is valuable. And they're just like, well, I can build this yeah. list in four hours. I'm like, yes, you definitely can. But why? Why would you do that? Yeah. Like you have other things to do. <laughs> yeah. um, so that like from a sales perspective, that's like the most frustrating conversation because I can't convince someone that their time is more valuable than they think it is. Um, so that was kind of like another, another challenge that we still, I mean, we still face that every day. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time. So I have only sort of one final question for you. What's something that I didn't ask that I should have? What, um, what should folks know about going into, to lead gen, uh, specifically addresses, that they should really think about or what's something that you've learned in the last two years that 
um, that we haven't really talked about? Yeah, I, well, I, we touched on this I probably briefly a couple of times. But the, I feel like the biggest thing is phone verification. If you're going to be mailing things, uh, is so important. Mm. Um, and we don't we don't do it for a lot of our clients because, like I said, like the vast majority are focused on email as the main channel. But if you're going to be sending something in the mail, I mean, I've heard of people sending items that are worth ten, twenty, thirty dollars in the mail because they're you know they wow. maybe they have a smaller total addressable market. They want to reach somebody sure. in the C-suite in a larger company, Fortune 500 or whatever. Um, but that, like, you don't want to mess that up. You want to make sure that data yeah. is confirmed and accurate. And the only way to do that, to know 100% sure, is to call uh, for addresses, for mailing addresses. Um, and so, you know, if you're considering, like, a small campaign to a really highly targeted list, like, have one of your sales reps or some of the marketing team, marketing team or someone, or you know, a company like ours, call and just make sure that the data uh, is accurate. Because I feel like a lot of people aren't doing that. Um, and they're just, re everybody's so reliant on email and they just want to stay online. They don't want to actually pick up the phone. And that's still mm -hmm. the best way to get information and to, to confirm information. Well, Joe, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to to have a conversation here. I, I know it's not part of your, your daily responsibilities. And so I think a, a lot of the folks that are watching are gonna really find your insights super valuable having run a, a lead gen business. And I, I can personally attest for, for Joe's data that it's fantastic. We do our own verification of the data that we buy. In Joe's case, like we, we validate all those addresses against USPS and everything comes back green. So if you're thinking about a lead gen service, get towards one of the best that we've ever found and you should check them out. I'll put Joe's contact information in the description if, if you're okay with that, Joe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for chatting with me. Thank you so much, Jordan. I appreciate it.